So, okay, we're going to cover reconstruction in Texas. Um, the way I've structured this talk is one, give you kind of a, an overview of some of the themes that I emphasize in my teaching. Um, this is not a lecture that's pitched uh, towards uh, middle schoolers. Uh, hopefully it is one that's pitched towards uh, middle school teachers, however. Um, and I trust your expertise in translating this and figuring out what of these themes are most helpful for you uh, when you go to the classroom. Uh, I'm also gonna be throwing tons of resources, websites, uh, documentaries at you. Um, so having a, a pen in hand will probably be helpful to kind of capture some of that. But again, uh, don't, don't be shy in reaching out to me if I can be of help in any way. So I want to start by saying that Reconstruction is, I think, the fulcrum of United States history. It's the origins of modernity. It's a second, perhaps failed American revolution. It's wildly dense, uh, very confusing. Um, it was, it is for us now, and it was for those that were living through it. Um, so my approach to reconstruction is less one that emphasizes coverage and really even one that maybe resists um, a tidy sense of coherence. Um, but I do try to focus on these two questions, uh, which will center kind of the talk today. First, how did Texans respond to emancipation? We know that slavery was the cause of the Civil War. Um, we can get into that some more if, if needed. Um, and emancipation marked the most radical redistribution of wealth in the entirety of world history, with the only exception of the Russian Revolution. Uh, this is a dramatic moment that requires the complete upheaval of society. How do folks actually respond to that, uh, that, that radical change? And second, was Reconstruction a success or failure? Uh, I like this question uh, because in answering this, you're gonna run up against the kind of difficulty of black and white yes and no um, um, answers. It partially depends on what was the purpose of Reconstruction, of course, uh, but I think tallying up uh, the moments and the ways that liberty advanced uh, and contracted is a kind of helpful way uh, to, to think about this period. So with that, let's jump in. Uh, and let's start uh, by realizing that Reconstruction begins before the Civil War ends. And I think that this is a helpful thing to do to kind of blur categories. We tend to think of history, you know, on a timeline with kind of rigid moments. Uh, but the truth is the edges are kind of blurry. So Reconstruction is, is happening during the war as the Union Army is both trying to defeat a foreign uh, or, or to try to defeat a foe while also reuniting the United States at the same time. So in this kind of emphasis on, on the early reconstruction, I like to emphasize uh, what General Sherman does with General Orders Number 15 in January of 1865. Uh, this is issued on the Sea Islands of South Carolina, which marked a real experiment in trying to imagine what a post-war uh, world might look like. Uh, in General Orders Number 15, uh, over 400,000 freed people were given land. We're given over 400,000 acres of land formerly held by enslavers. Um, and, and this uh, moment of land re redistribution marked a, a possibility of what reconstruction could have been. Uh, of course, it's not what it did uh, turn out to become. But I like emphasizing this also because it gives me a way to talk about uh, the visions and the desires of free people themselves. The first of the primary source documents in the little packet that I gave you uh, was an interview that the freed people uh, in South Carolina um, uh, had with uh, representatives from General Sherman uh, that shows you what freed people wanted to do after emancipation. Maybe we'll talk about that more when we get into the primary sources. Of course, uh, another example of Reconstruction beginning uh, before the war ends uh, is the passage of the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment, which abolishes chattel slavery in the United States. We're going to come back to this at the end of the talk and thinking about the kind of legacies of Reconstruction. Uh, but I want to acknowledge that this happens, you know, before the war is over, but it's obviously a kind of formative uh, um, uh, new regime that's going to govern social relations and the economy uh, in the aftermath of the war. So when does the war end? This is, of course, uh, a lively question. Here in Texas, I think it's, it, it's helpful to, to, to obviously foreground Juneteenth in these conversations. June 19th, 1865, Major Granger uh, of the Union Army lands in Galveston 
And the Emancipation Proclamation, which had been issued two and a half years earlier, finally becomes real uh, for many Texans. Um, my memory, by the way, of, of, of you know, um, both middle school and high school social studies classes were a lot of flags uh, in the room. And if you're looking for another flag to add, this is the flag of Juneteenth, which I think is a pretty potent um, and powerful uh, thing worth remembering. So Juneteenth uh, marks the coming of emancipation to Texas. Uh, but what happens after freed people gain their, their so-called freedom, uh, so-called as we'll see? Uh, what, what do freed people want? What do they do? First thing often they do is they try to move around. Uh, we know that the number one priority of freed people is to attempt to reunite families. We have to remember that the institution of slavery shattered uh, about 40% of enslaved families. Um, so we've got huge numbers of people that have been separated from loved ones by, uh, by the institution of slavery, and the number one priority is attempting to reunite families. Now, Often folks kind of equate emancipation uh, with the so-called Great Migration, the movement of African Americans from the South into you know, the North, the Midwest, or into New York even. Um, but I think that that's, act that's actually not correct. Uh, the Great Migration happens after several decades. Uh, really what we have is folks staying in the South, uh, trying to reconstitute their families. And I think the best resources for us to understand and to teach uh, this process of immediate post-emancipation uh, Black life is to look at the Texas Freedom Colonies Project. I'm going to say that one more time, the Texas Freedom Colonies Project. This is a map that shows all of the so-called freedom colonies formed in the aftermath of emancipation, Black Americans trying to reconstitute families and trying to gain levels of autonomy um, from their former enslavers and, and other white Americans. If, uh, you know, in many places throughout the state, you have a freedom colony near you, I think it's a wonderful activity to have students investigate it. Um, here in Dallas, uh, the Deep Ellum neighborhood, which is where a lot of my students like to enjoy the bars and concert venues, uh, was in fact a freedom colony. Um, and I, I, I like the opportunity to change my students' perception of this neighborhood that they think for very different reasons of reminding them how in fact it was formed and the role it played in the post emancipation life uh, of Black Texans. Okay, so we've got migration, we've got fo folks moving around. We also have uh, an insatiable desire to learn. During slavery, um, and of course in the tumult of the Civil War, uh, black literacy was criminalized in much of the South, including in Texas, uh, to teach uh, an enslaved person to read was a crime. With the erasure uh, of this institution, with the aftermath of Juneteenth, uh, Black Texans want to learn. Uh, so we see a quick uh, formation of a series of schools. We see a number of Northern missionaries, uh, many of whom uh, were, were, were Black. And the second document that I'm giving you is a document from a Black Philadelphian, Charlotte Fortin, who traveled down into the South during Reconstruction to create schools. Uh, I think it's fun document for teachers. You can see some of the frustration of teaching uh, during the era of Reconstruction. And it's useful for students, uh, for them to get an indication of a time when uh, you know, people wanted nothing more than education. Maybe a slightly different experience uh, for, for a lot of your students, certainly for mine. Uh, I like reminding them that education is a privilege and it's exciting and, and people should be fired up about it. Uh, okay, so we've got uh, movement to reunite families. We've got the formation of freedom colonies. We've got folks uh, going to learn. We also have the formation of black churches. And I'll say that actually, this is a moment where I expect our historiography to change pretty considerably in about the next five years. The dominant narrative emphasizes the creation of independent black churches, which is of course happening during this era. Uh, but there's a number of books that are uh, just about being finished right now that actually show that uh, churches were one of the strongest places of biracial um, uh, community and identity um, in, in the US South. Okay, but well, we've got creation of churches, creation of schools, reuniting of families, formation of freedom colonies. We also have black Americans eagerly participating in the political system. Uh, this happens all over the place. In Texas, there will be 52 black Texans that will serve in either uh, the legislature or as delegates um, to uh, an eventual constitutional convention in the state of Texas. Um, of course, these black Texans uh, 
like black Southerners elsewhere, uh, are participating in politics through the Republican Party, the party that is now associated with emancipation um, and, and, and an opportunity for black Texans to engage um, in the political system and the reconstruction of Texas. Now, what sets Texas apart from much of the rest of the South when we talk about this area, era is the reality that the most powerful military power in the uh, area of Texas during this period uh, was not the Confederate Army, it was not the Union Army, it was Native American military power. The area in red that you have outlined here is, is what's known as Comancheria, uh, the region patrolled by the Comanches. Uh, of course, we also have the Apaches and other indigenous communities, which maintained a very strong and very serious uh, military autonomy during this period. In fact, during the war years, Native Americans were able to claw back uh, considerable amounts of territory that had been lost um, by, uh, by settler colonialism and the erosion of Native American territory prior to the war. The frontier itself receded as much as 100 miles uh, during the period of the war. So reconstruction is going to be both kind of determining what to do about the question of emancipation. How do we uh, re-engage uh, with the union um, in the state of Texas? Uh, and there's also the reality that there are still very powerful Native American groups um, who have in fact become more powerful uh, because of the civil war. We'll see that that transition from civil wars to Indian wars uh, is a fairly quick one um, and, and even uh, particularly quick in the state of Texas. Now, the other thing to remember about Texas um, is, of course, Texas has a border with Mexico. And it's during this period that we have the second Mexican empire, really the client state, uh, where we have uh, you know, a, a French uh, appointed emperor um, uh, in, the, in the nation of Mexico. This brings considerable anxiety to Texans, but also to the United States. So in, in fact, of the 50,000 soldiers that at one point or another were in Texas during the period of Reconstruction, the vast majority of them are not dealing with the problem of emancipation, are not trying to protect the rights of free people, are not really working to reintegrate Texas into the Union. They're creating a buffer between uh, Mexico and its new alliance with France um, and the United States. Um, so really for most of Reconstruction, there were never more than 3,000 soldiers in the state at any one time. And most of them are preoccupied with either facing Mexico or trying to deal uh, with Native Americans um, in the Western part of the state. Okay. But of course, we know that the part of the Union Army that was charged with protecting the rights of freed people um, was the Freedmen's Bureau which did exist in Texas, even though it was wildly outnumbered, um, it was present. And I think the best way to, to teach about the Freedmen's Bureau is to focus on materials that the National Archives, that's archives.gov. They have a great set of images and documents related to the Freedmen's Bureau. Go to archives.gov in the search, uh, just type Freedmen's Bureau, you'll find tons of stuff that's really helpful. So to zero into Texas, the first uh, attempt to reintegrate the state of Texas into the Union uh, takes place in the state constitution of 1866. For our purposes here, uh, what I really want my students to know about the state constitution of 1866 was its role in creating the Texas Black Code. Um, really, it's an attempt uh, where to, to recreate as much of the system before the Civil War in the state of Texas to maintain the institution of white supremacy, which of course the Texas Secession document lists as a cause of the war um, and to minimize uh, the rights and the freedoms of freed people. The third document that you have in your list of documents for me uh, are the black laws in the state of Texas and we'll talk about those uh, in just a bit. Okay, so we've got the black laws, we've got the, uh, the first constitution in 1866. We also have the creation of the new labor regime of sharecropping. Okay, uh, sharecropping, uh, we, you can get a sense of from these black laws, they, they, they are kind of rooted in this notion um, that expects uh, formerly enslaved people to remain where they are, to continue performing labor uh, in ways that they had previously been performing it. Um, however, instead of uh, being, being owned, uh, they will be in debt. 
Now, one thing that I, that I do with my students is I give them the United Nations uh, definition of debt peonage, which is officially a form of modern day slavery, according to the United Nations. Um, and I ask them what, what the similarities and differences are uh, between uh, modern slavery and debt peonage and sharecropping. Um, it's not a one-to-one -one similarity, but there certainly are a, a number of, of, of similarities. One thing I do like to point out though, that prior to the Civil War, cotton planters were getting incredibly rich. We've got a, a, you know huge swings in the economy, but when the profits are good, they're astronomical. Uh, it's the most dramatic way to make money in the antebellum period. That changes in the aftermath of the Civil War, partially because of the introduction of increased competition from Egypt and India for cotton. So the cotton markets are plummeting, uh, which is going to add uh, greater economic pressure for everybody in Texas involved in the cotton markets. Okay, now we can't talk about reconstruction without talking about terrorism. And in fact, I often foreground this as reconstruction considering it the era of the triumph of terrorism. Um, it's a uncomfortable reality uh, to acknowledge that sometimes terrorists win. And I think that it's pretty undeniable that the story of reconstruction is a story of American terrorists in fact winning. On Christmas Eve of 1865, uh, we have the Ku Klux Klan forming in Tennessee. It takes only a few years before we have the Klan and very other similar organizations operating in Texas. Uh, and the things that it's important to know about the first Ku Klux Klan is that it is intimately bound up with the Confederate Army. Uh, the, the first head of the Ku Klux Klan was General Nathaniel Bedford Forrest, the general in the Confederate Army, uh, and many of the kind of um, local organizations that, that really governed the Klan were former Confederate units. So the Klan was active. In 1866, the Inspector General William E. Strong of the Union Army wrote, quote, they seem to take every opportunity, and by the way, he wrote this when he was describing Texas, quote, they seem to take every opportunity to vent their rage and hatred upon Texas Blacks. They are frequently beaten unmercifully and, and shown down like wild beasts without any provocation, followed by hounds and maltreated in every way. This is the reality of life in Texas during Reconstruction. It's a place of tremendous violence, uh, mostly and primarily racial violence with white militia groups targeting uh, black Texans. Uh, we'll also see uh, a little bit more of an example of this in the fourth document, which is General Reynolds describing the situation in Texas. To give you a couple of names um, of, of victims of this type of racial violence, I think it's important that we don't just talk about these as statistics, but we give, give, we give names. A.R. Wilson, who was a voting registrar in Burleson, Texas. A.R. Wilson was woken up in the middle of the night, uh, mutilated with knives, he was scalped, and he was thrown into the Brazos River. In Jefferson County, uh, 1,200 to 1,500 residents of Jefferson County attended a midnight Ku Klux Klan ceremony in 1868. In Liberty County, a freed woman was shot for, quote, using saucy words. And also in Liberty County, a freed man was stabbed in church uh, after he was accused of standing in the way of white ladies in church. Um, okay. So this is what's happening in Texas. I think it's useful to gesture to what's happening elsewhere in the South as well. In Texas, the, viol the violence is mostly hyper-localized and on fairly small scales, uh, but in other parts of the South, it's much uh, on a much larger scale. In Memphis, Tennessee, for example, on May 1st uh, of 1866, the so-called Memphis riot, uh, which really was, was simply a massacre, it began uh, when white policemen saw recently mustered out black soldiers still carrying their Union Army uh, uh, gear. Um, they were attacked, and really what happened in Memphis was black uh, residents were kicked out of the city. The black community in Memphis was either uh, killed, wounded, or forced to flee. An entire United States city just ejects uh, a population of people uh, in May of 1866. In New Orleans, um, which we see the pattern um, um, that particularly takes place in Texas, and I point to the research of Greg Cantrell, who I think you guys heard from. Uh, Greg Cantrell uh, has looked at violence in Texas and found that most of the racial violence was centered around political moments. The most dramatic example of this nationally happens in New Orleans uh, in July 30th of 1866, 
when the Republican Party attempts to register a number of voters, um, but a white mob of former Confederates now functionally acting like a military wing of the Democratic Party uh, attacked local uh, Black New Orleanians who were trying to register to vote. Uh, a total of 150 Black casualties um, uh, and, and, and on, the, the only death uh, was, was, was one white death of a kind of perpetrator of this violence. Um, one last example also in New Orleans, the uh, Colfax massacre. Uh, this is the most violent moment. 150 black men uh, are murdered uh, by white Southern men. 150 black men killed, only three white Southern men killed. Uh, again, uh, this happens uh, when a group of black Republicans were gathering to meet. Um, the black Republicans were demanded to surrender and put down their arms. And as soon as they did, uh, they were slaughtered. Um, I have to, when I talk about the Colfax massacre, I have to acknowledge that to this day, there still is only one um, uh, recognition of this. Um, well, actually two um, that, that are still, still up. One, we have the, uh, a gravestone of some of the white so-called heroes um, that, are, that are celebrated here on this tombstone. Uh, dying for white supremacy. Um, and we have an official marker here uh, that, that talked about this as marking an end of carpetbag misrule in the South. Um, we have a long way to go in this country with our monuments uh, of, of coming even close to representing an accurate history. Uh, and while I pick on Louisiana, I have to acknowledge that here in the state of Texas, we have our own myths and monuments as well. Um, the myth to the, the monument to the Confederate dead uh, begins in all caps with bold letters that it was uh, in service of states' rights, which of course we know is not the case. Actually, the largest states' right issue in the era was the Fugitive Slave Act. In this case, Texans uh, and other Southerners wanted a larger, more invasive federal government superseding the rights of, of Northern states in enforcing the Fugitive Slave Law. Okay, a lot of violence. Um, but despite that violence, we still see Black Texans fighting back, trying to use the powers of the ballot box. The first constitution um, is going to be repealed when the federal government becomes more involved in requiring uh, a greater enforcement of liberty um, and, and a targeted uh, focus on subduing the terrorism of the Ku Klux Klan and others. This leads to the constitutional uh, uh, convention called in 1868, that leads to the Texas Constitution of 1869. What I think is important for students to know about this is this is a moment uh, where we have 60,000 white Texans voting and we have 50,000 black Texans voting. Uh, the story of reconstruction is not one of kind of uniform uh, barbarity, but it's, opportunity, it's, it's an opportunity of hope. It's a place uh, where black Texans risk their lives uh, to vote and try to participate in the political process. One of the remarkable things that comes out of this constitutional convention is a study that looks at racial violence and tracks uh, the names um, of 939 murders um, between 1865 and 1868. Um, of those murders, um, uh, the majority of them were committed to black Texans uh, by white Texans. Okay, so 1869, we've got a new constitution in Texas one that grants the full rights of citizenship to black Texans, uh, creates a unified system of education, uh, and generally reflects the goals of unionists uh, or Republicans uh, in the state of Texas. Okay. Um, while I'm talking about other changes that happens in Texas, I like to point into the National um, uh, Moral Land Grant Act, which creates a series of public universities, uh, including Texas A&M. Uh, you probably have got a couple of students that, that are Aggies fans, and it's, it's important to talk about the origins of Texas A&M in coming out of this land grant movement, a moment nationally where the Republican Party is invested in building up the infrastructure of the United States. Another uh, kind of element of Reconstruction, particularly this era of Reconstruction that involves um, a, a kind of greater congressional activity uh, is the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, which simply uh, establishes birthright citizenships, that black Texans are citizens of the United States, um, period. Now, of course, what laws are and what their enforcement are um, is, is, is a different story, but the establishment of this law marks a kind of radical moment that for the first time unequivocally states that black Americans are Americans. 
along with the uh, 14th Amendment, we also have the 15th Amendment designed to uh, to firmly establish the franchise and voting rights for Black Texans. As you'll see in the uh, Black Code um, of, of, the, of 1860, uh, the, the first uh, uh, constitution, um, that, that Black Texans were not allowed to, to vote. 15th Amendment says that in fact they are. But again, we have a question of uh, what laws say and how are they enforced. So we have white terrorism, uh, but I wanna make a point to my students uh, that this is not a story of kind of, you know, racist white Southerners and, you know, um, progressive Northerners. Uh, I always show this headline, which uh, Kaiser Ulysses which is a anti-Ulysses S. Grant headline uh, complaining about his attempt to subdue the Ku Klux Klan. This headline is not uh, from New Orleans. It's not from Galveston. It's from Philadelphia. Um, white supremacy was a national United States value. Uh, white Americans North and South agreed that the United States should be a nation of white people. Um, and so we see resistance to reconstruction uh, of North and South. What also is happening during this period is a national uh, economic depression. Uh, first, we have uh, the pa a panic that occurs in uh, uh, so-called Black Friday. Uh, September 24th of 1869, uh, we've got a, a, a kind of criminal attempt to corner the gold market. You've got students interested in the GameStop uh, kind of thing. This is a way you could talk about wild swings in the markets and their potential danger. Um, uh, this attempt to, to, to corner the gold market leads to uh, this kind of economic crisis that only becomes worse four years later uh, when there is the Panic of 1873, often known as the Great Depression during this period. That's in fact what they called it. Um, huge economic crisis that devastates the nation, including the Texas economy. During this moment of economic kind of uh, depression, the commitment to reconstruction wanes even further. We'll see that partially coming out of the economic uh, crisis, the Democrats will retain power in Texas. Uh, but I, I think it's helpful to point at nationally, why uh, does the United States give up on reconstruction? That comes down to the contested election of 1876. Uh, really, you know, folks point to the fact that this is a such a close election. And in order to secure his power, Republican Rutherford V. Hayes promises to withdraw the army. Uh, which is often what folks point to as the end of Reconstruction. Truthfully, if you look at the uh, intra the, the, the platforms uh, for the Democratic candidate, Samuel Tilden, and the Republican candidate, Rutherford B. Hayes, they're all but identical. Uh, at this point, the nation had really given up on Reconstruction already. Um, you know, the, the, the formal withdrawal of troops takes place later, uh, but the national commitment has ended. And indeed, in Texas, Democrats had seized power uh, in 1872, even before uh, the 1876 end of Reconstruction. When Democrats take power, they abolished the state police force, uh, which was the kind of most effective tool at restraining white terrorism. Uh, they localized the state school system, eliminating any hope for a racially integrated school system in Texas. Uh, uh, localization is really just another word for uh, segregation when it comes to schools. They're also capitalizing on the fact that uh, the Republican um, government had refused to wage kind of full scale war against Native American groups. They were instead focusing on uh, the tactic of establishing reservations instead of engaging in military activity and Texans did not uh, find that very popular. So uh, Democrats swing into power in 1873 uh, and and uh, will quickly establish a, a new um, a new constitution, uh, which really returns uh, uh, Texas and establishes uh, the Jim Crow as as a kind of legal um, um, a, 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 the legal foundation uh, of the postbellum period in Texas. Okay. Last thing I want to talk about very quickly is what happens to slavery in the aftermath uh, of Reconstruction. We talked about the Thirteenth Amendment. Uh, kind of in some ways beginning Reconstruction before the war ended. Um, it's also important to note that in many ways, uh, uh, the 13th Amendment has a loophole, which just really created a new form of slavery. 
you may know the a Ava DuVernay documentary on Netflix. Um, I think that that's worth at least the very first part of it. It's helpful in this. Uh, if you want something a little bit more academic, there's a great uh, PBS documentary, which is still available on YouTube called Slavery by Another Name that talks about how uh, uh, the use of black codes and laws that targeted black Texans for arrest uh, allowed black Texans to be functionally re-enslaved. Um, you'll see that the loophole in the 13th Amendment is that slavery is abolished unless you've been convicted of a crime. This comes to Texas in a pretty prominent way, particularly Southeast Texas. Uh, this is a photograph of Sugarland, um, where in 1867, two railroad companies uh, hired prison inmates to construct uh, the railroad beds. Um, this is a photograph of a recently rediscovered gravesite where uh, convicts uh, were buried uh, outside of Sugarland. Um, uh, part of working the, the uh, Imperial Sugar Company's uh, prison farm. The Imperial Sugar Company employed convict laborers uh, in this period. And if this is something you want to explore and, and discuss with your students, uh, there's a great project called the Convict Leasing and Labor Project. The Convict Leasing and Labor Project, you can learn more about what they're up to at CLLPTX, Convict Leasing and Labor Project, CLLPTX.org. Check that out. Uh, so Texas formally outlawed the practice in 1910, uh, but continued to force prisoners to work without pay on prison-owned farms and factories, uh, a, a process that actually still does continue today. Texas is just one of five states um, that continues to force inmates to work without pay. Okay, uh, another photograph of uh, Texas convicts uh, working on establishing railroads in Southeast Texas. Okay, so a lot of ground really quick. Hopefully we can clean up some of it in the Q&A. Two questions again, how did Americans respond uh, to emancipation? I think it's helpful to think about both white Americans and black Americans. Uh, and was reconstruction a success or failure? What are the successes? What are the failures? What are the goals of reconstruction and how do we assess them? All right, I think I'm a few minutes over, but let's, uh, let's talk about, let, let's talk more Q&A.